Hi everybody, and welcome to Willow Creek. We're so glad that you're tuning in with us. In a moment, we're gonna to worship together, but before we do, we're gonna start things a little bit differently today. I don't know if you've heard, but kids are not in school right now. I know, it's crazy. They're doing this thing called distance learning. What is distance learning? None of us had any idea a month ago. So what I decided to do is do a couple Zoom calls with some of the kids among us just to find out how distance learning is going for them and for their parents. Check this out. Hi, Eden. Oh, I know it's hard to do these Zoom calls. I feel the same way. What's your name? AJ. AJ, what's your favorite letter? So what do you do to get ready for school? I stay in my pajamas all day. How long ago was the last day you wore normal clothes? I don't remember. <laughs> I just noticed the shirt that you're wearing. Do you wear that every day? What do you think about distance learning? Number six. Six? It's like a four. Three. Three. Which one would you say describes how your parents feel? The red one. The red one? What is your least favorite subject? 100% math. Our last topic was about finding measurements of center. That kind of sounds like yoga to me. What is three times three? Nine. That's how old I am. Wow. How was the start of your year in kindergarten? Good. I know this is your first year in school, but not every year is like this. What has been the most fun assignment you've had so far? None. Have you done any interesting projects like any Oh, yeah. A uh, dad, can I show that? E-G-G-M. Did you just spell something so I wouldn't understand what it is? Yes. Oh, you're bringing me with you. Okay. Oh, my goodness. What is, <laughs> what is on the wall here? Kind of looks like something from Stranger Things. My uh, language arts teacher, one of the assignments that she gave us was to write about what we were doing during the like quarantine time. So I picked a song. Have you recorded this song? Yeah, my parents, we recorded a video and recorded the audio and stuff, and then my parents posted it on Facebook. And it's gone, it's gotten a lot of like comments and hits. Maybe it's too soon to say this, but would you say you've gone viral? Kind of, from what I know of going viral. It's just me and my euphonium Sitting here, stuck at homeium Nothing but time to talk on the phonium All day long If you have a question at home and you need some help, do you ask your mom or your dad? My mom, do you ask my mom? Mom. My mom, she helps me a lot. She's older than my dad, and she's also smarter than her. Sounds like your dad really married up then. Usually I just ask, like, my dad, because he has all the knowledge. Your dad has all the knowledge? Oh my goodness, I could use him at our house. My dad's brain is a calculator. Literally? Yeah, he can do like 100 times 232 in like three seconds. 23,200. Is it though? I don't know. We're going to have to ask your dad. What would your dad say? He would start just getting off topic, then go back on topic. Off topic, go back on topic. Off topic, go back on topic. Anything that you would like to say to all the teachers out there about the job that they're doing with distance learning? Better than my parents. <laughs> no math homework. If there was one thing that you could say to all the parents out there to encourage them. Good luck. Keep trying. Hang on, I have a quote bookmark. And it says, but you know, happiness can be found even in the darkest of times if one only remembers to turn on the light. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you helped us turn on the light today. Thank you. Thank you. To all you students out there, keep up the great work. To the teachers among us, thanks for all the extra time and energy you're putting in to figure this out. And to all you parents out there, you're doing a much better job than you think you are. Now we're gonna turn our attention to worship, so wherever you are, turn your volume way up and let's join our voices together and sing out to God.
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I dream from. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my song. You are good. God is good. God is good. You know, when I think about the goodness of God in my life, I recognize that it doesn't always mean that things get easier. But what it does mean is that in every season, in every situation, God is faithful. God is near. God is still in control. And He's still good. And I believe that's true for me. I believe it's true for you. And I believe that's true for our church family. It makes me think about last weekend. You know, we celebrated Easter like we've never celebrated Easter before. And even though it was different, it was personally a really encouraging time, a good time to remember the good news of Jesus Christ. And we wanted to let you in on what we were all a part of last weekend. You know, we found out that 20,000 devices were tuned into our weekend services. And we know that many people participate in streams together. So we can safely say that tens of thousands of people were gathered to celebrate Jesus with us. We also found out that 300 people made decisions for Christ. So good. You know, we're not just about numbers, are we, church? We're about what they represent, and they represent individual lives coming to Jesus Christ. 
So we just wanted to spend some time thanking God for being so good to us, amen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing a song that's familiar to us as a Willow family. It's a song that we've sung in good times and in hard times. And we're gonna lead it in a way to help you remember that worship is not just about looking at a worship leader or listening to a great musician, but it's about all of us lifting up our worship to a God who deserves it, amen. So would you join in with us as we sing? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father. Sing out. 
still moving, still moving, even now, still moving, even as we speak, still moving, even as we go through challenges, still moving, even as we go through trials, God, you are still moving, not because of anything that we can do, but because you are simply worthy and you are simply good. Father, even now when things are challenging, God, even now when things are continuously changing, God, we press into your character that you are good, you are perfect, you are holy, you are merciful, you are forgiving. You are the ultimate peace giver. God, everything that we lack right now, God, we come to you again to receive who you are. And Father, I personally have seen you do it before, time and time again in my own life, in my own family's life. And right now, Holy Spirit, we are believing for you to do it again right now. With every family that's tuning in, every life that's tuning in, whether they know you or not, God, that you do not hoard your love. You are not selfish with your love. You are generous and abundantly giving. And so right now, Holy Spirit, I ask um, 
that we be, that I just ask that you fill every house, every life, every soul, God, that we would even uh, in the next weeks, God, we'll continue to hear testimonies and stories of you doing it again. Miracle signs and wonders that you have done it again. Healing that you have done it again, Father. Thank you that we can trust in your word that says when we lift you high, when we lift your name, that you draw men near to you, God. And that's my prayer even now as we move on in worship, as we continue in worship, Father. That as we lift your name, Father, you would draw the world near to you, near to your heart, Lord. What a perfect opportunity to come back to the Father and to surrender our lives again, even for the first time or for the hundredth time, Lord. You are worthy of it all. We love you and we thank you. We thank you that you are doing it again. We thank you that you are the King of our hearts. And we thank you for who you are and what you've done on the cross and what you're going to do even in this moment for every life tuning in. We love you, Father, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Hey, Willow, if you've been around for a while, you know that we've been in the process of finding a new senior pastor. If you're new, Steve Gillen and then Ray Johnston after that, they both taught here recently, but they have faithfully served as interim senior pastors while our elder board has engaged in a search process for a permanent senior pastor. And before I go on any further, I just want to say thank you to both Steve and Ray for how they have served and loved our church so well. I also want to thank you for the ways that you have invested in our church family. Uh, we've experienced a lot over the last few years. But God has been moving in and through our church because of the ways that you've been pursuing Christ, the ways that you've been committed to community, and the ways that you've been serving each other. It's been an honor for me to get to be on this journey with you. Now, as you may know, our elders began the search for a permanent senior pastor in June of last year. And they have led through this process with a lot of prayer, and they've wanted to be very thorough in this process. They've been committed to unity in the decision, and they've been seeking God and wise counsel each step of the way. And today, I'm pretty excited. I'm excited for them to share some very good news with you. Jeff? Hello, I'm Jeff Mason, and I serve as CGO on the Elder Board. When we began this work last year, we didn't know the journey God would lead us on. We were eager to find a new senior pastor, but felt the weight of this decision and wanted to seek God's direction each step of the way. He has shown us his goodness and faithfulness. As we narrow the field of candidates towards the final selection, we involve senior leadership in the discernment process, and the elders wish to thank them for their time and wisdom, especially during a period when they were planning for virtual church services. I also want to thank the staff and congregation for their grace, support, and prayers. We also know that churches all around the world have been praying for discernment in this process. We have felt those prayers, and we thank you. While we wish we could be in the same room for this announcement, we are pleased to announce we have selected a new senior pastor. I'd like Barb Butts, the chair of the selection committee, to share more. Hi, Willow. Today, I'm immensely grateful and excited to announce Dave Dummett as our new senior pastor. Throughout this process, we knew we were searching for a uniquely gifted pastor and leader, and we were trusting God to provide. We were looking for someone with a passion for God's kingdom, who holds values that align with our churches and experience leading a multi-site church. Dave is just that. He comes to us from 242 Community Church in Southeast Michigan, a church he founded 15 years ago with a vision to have high impact in their community. Dave has a heart for helping people take first and next steps in their faith. He lives and leads with compassion and inspires others to serve. Those things are at the core of who we are as Willow, and we can't wait to see how God will use Dave here. While waiting has been hard, God's faithfulness has been evident. I'd love for you to hear from Dave. Hey, Willow Creek. My name's Dave, and I am so excited to become a part of the Willow family. For the last 15 years, my family and I have had the privilege of launching and leading 242 Community Church in Southeast Michigan. And over these last few months, we have sensed God leading us to come and to be a part of what he's doing in and through Willow Creek. 
Now, I got to tell you, I could not be more excited. Looking back years ago, when my father was dropping me off for my freshman year at Wheaton College, I had heard about this church that would do just about anything to reach lost people. And so we decided to check out a weekend service. And I, I think I could point to where we sat, almost the exact seats in the Lakeside Auditorium. And sure enough, when the service opened, they played a Beatles song, and my mind was blown. And I, I could point to leader after leader, pastor after pastor, that has been influenced and impacted, just like I was, by the ministry of Willow Creek. People grasping the importance of reaching lost people or understanding new insights about leadership. Hey, last year, uh, being approached about the senior pastor role, uh, that was a very humbling thing to think about. The first two times that I was asked about pursuing the conversation, I didn't really sense that my work at 242 was done. 242 has been innovating and thriving and planting new campuses. Our team was strong. I just, I just didn't want to leave. I had no reason to. But last year, something started stirring. Now, lots of people all over the world, including me, we've been rooting for Willow these past few difficult years. Uh, and when I was approached a third time about the position, something started stirring in my soul. Uh, maybe I should take a closer look at this and, and at least have a conversation. You know, my wife, Rachel, and I, we've, we've always sought to make these kinds of decisions through the lens of one primary question. How can we make the most impact possible with our lives? And 242 was thriving. It was in the hands of incredible, uh, incredible leaders. And we started to get the sense that maybe that wasn't the reason to stay, but the reason we could have the confidence to explore a new assignment, that maybe God was calling us to Willow. And so here we are. And I, I honestly, I couldn't be more excited about the future of Willow Creek. Um, now you got to understand that I'm a church planter. I spent most of my ministry involved in planting churches, starting new churches. And in the early planning stages, you'll ask a few questions like, do we have a team? Let's look at the culture. What are the resources? Do we have the right vision? The basic building blocks of what it takes to, to start a church. And guys, when I look at Willow, that's what I see. I see these incredible building blocks uh, that will launch Willow into a brand new future. Uh, guys, I remember when we set out to launch 242, we, we had a launch team of only 35 people. And that first Sunday, I wasn't sure if anybody would, would actually show up. But I remember being backstage, and I heard extra chairs being set up, and I was blown away. God surprised us. There were over 500 people that showed up for that first worship service. 35 people prayed. 35 people invited friends. 35 people volunteered on teams. And God brought 500 people. It was amazing. So that next year, you know, we had about 600 people coming to church at, at that time. And I, I looked at those people and I reminded them, you know, last year the launch team was 35 and we had 500 people show up. What if all of you were a launch team? What if each one of you prayed? What if each one of you invited a friend or joined a team? Imagine what God could do. And guys, we've been relaunching 242 that way pretty much every year since. And for the last 15 years, God has been surprising us over and over. So many new baptisms, new campuses, new innovations, new miracles. Now, Willow, Willow's not a new church, but we are stepping into a new season together. And as we do... Let me just go ahead and admit it. First of all, I, I don't think I have what it takes to bring Willow into a fresh season of ministry, at least not alone. But I have all the confidence in the world that together, with God's help, we can. You know, they tell me over 30,000 people are watching your online services each weekend. Now, I've seen what God can do with 35 people. I can't wait to see what God does with a 30,000 person launch team as God moves us into a fresh new season. Rachel and I, we look forward to getting to know you and serving alongside you. Willow, the best is yet to come. As you heard from Dave, he's just got a tremendous heart for God's kingdom and for Willow. 
And look, I haven't known Dave for very long, only two, three weeks, but I have been struck already with the fresh vision, energy, excitement that he's bringing to our church. I've been encouraged by his humility, inspired by his ability to, to build teams and empower others. Guys, I can't wait for you to get to know him more in the coming weeks. And for me, you know, I've been around for a while. And as someone who's been a part of Willow for a long time, I am so optimistic about the future of God's congregation at Willow Creek Community Church. Guys, God is working. And Dave's vision for collaboration, teamwork, his intense devotion to reaching people with the gospel of Jesus, it just fires me up. I also want to specifically thank our elders. Thanks for your leadership in this process. Our elders have collectively spent thousands of hours learning, researching, praying, seeking wisdom around this decision. Their heart to honor God and to seek God in each step has been evident and has served us all. So to every elder board member, thank you. Thanks for the way that you have loved and served our church. Now, for all of us, I encourage you to learn more about Dave and this whole process by uh, hopping onto willowcreek.org. But for now, would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you have us. Thank you that you are working in this church. Lord, we want to be a people that love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are your congregation. And right now, God, we just praise you for the way that you continue to lead us, even when we don't deserve it. God, you are good to us. And thanks for bringing Dave into the Willow family. God, we just pray that you would bless he and his family as they move. Lord, would you continue to work in them? Would you continue to prompt them? And for all of us, God, we open up our hands and we say, we are your church. We love you, God. We want to serve you, God. We want to follow you, God. We pray that together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, well, today we're starting a series called Standing Strong in a Shaken World. And the idea behind the series is what needs to be inside of us to stand strong when the world is going crazy outside of us? Now we've got some notes for this. So if you're watching on willowcreek.tv, you can just click on the notes tab and be able to follow along there. Or you can just go to willowcreek.org slash next steps. And teaching us today is our interim senior pastor, Ray Johnston. So let's welcome Ray. Hey, thanks, Matt. I'm Ray Johnston. And the, Willow, the first thing I want to say is this. I couldn't be more thrilled by what's in store for your future. Um, when I arrived here, you just need to know, friends were saying, I am praying for Willow. One person told me it's the most prayed for church in America. A pastor friend of mine said, hey, man, it's like America's church. That's kind of like my church, too. And I started a prayer list for whoever the senior pastor was going to be. And I actually, I want to show you my prayer list. I'm going to put it on the TV screen. I have been praying that the new pastor would have these six characteristics. Uh, number one, somebody that was God honoring. They had a live, vital relationship with God. Second thing is this, a pastor that loves well and leads well. A church like Willow needs both. Third is this, a healthy home. Okay? I wanted somebody just praying that somebody would go, man, I am fully committed to ministry, but I am more committed to my family and my marriage, and I, the, the health of their home will spill into the church. Fourth was this, somebody that is biblically based preaching so that you are being delivered and taught the word of God. Five is this, a passion for people far away from God. Your church started because of a passion for people far away from God. You taught American churches to care about people that were far away from God. And I've been praying for somebody that walks in with that and continues to champion that value for Willow Creek. And the sixth thing was this, somebody that comes in and they have a fresh vision from God for the future of this ministry and what it could become. And I could not be more excited. And the reason is this, every church in America has one thing in common. They all have a past. I believe God wants to give you a future. And, and Dave Dummett, Dave is a good friend of mine. I have known him for a long time. I was not involved in the selection of Dave, but when I heard his name came up, my heart left because we, I hire a lot of pastors. We have a staff of about 350 at Bayside. And five years ago, I tried to hire Dave Dummett and we did everything we could. He and his wife flew in three times. They fell in love with us. We fell in love with them. And somehow we got to the end of it and we were like, hey, come. And he was like, I something in me, I just can't. And I've spent five years wondering why that didn't work out. And now I know. 
And I believe God's hand has been all over this. And this is an answer to prayer. It is going to be really fun in the next few weeks. I'm going to ask Dave one question a week. And we're going to put that his answers into the message so you get to know him and his heart and what he cares about. And then at uh, the beginning of June, he'll arrive and off you go. And I just, I am so thrilled. God has been so good on this. It's embarrassing. And I would like to thank everybody there for your patience. Some things in life are worth waiting for. So Willow, congratulations. Now, on to the message, okay? The message theme for the next few weeks is this, standing strong in a shaken world, okay? One of my favorite books of all time was a book written by a guy named Robert Fulgham. And in that book, he said, all I needed to know, I learned in kindergarten which unfortunately I read after spending $40,000 on graduate school. And I heard him speak one time and he had a very interesting observation. He said, find any group of little children and ask that group of little kids, how many of you can sing? Every hand goes up. What can you sing? Anything. What if you know the words? We'll make them up. He said, ask that group of little kids, what can you draw? We can draw anything. Um, can you draw a jungle and the president eating something? Oh, no problem. How big do you want it? They all look like stick figures, but they're convinced they can draw. And he said, find that same group of kindergartners 25 years later when they're adults. And then ask them, how many of you can sing? Nobody. How many of you can draw? Nobody. And then fold you as a brilliant question. He just said, what happened? What happened between kindergarten and adulthood to stomp out and pave over this God-given zest and for living that God puts in the heart of every single kid that was ever born, but by the time they're adults, our culture has paved it over and smashed that down and destroyed joy and replaced hope with discouragement, which is exactly what everybody's feeling right now. There's a, there's a verse in Ephesians chapter two, and it's the beginning verse, six words that mark our age. Check it out. It says this, Ephesians, Paul writes to Ephesians, says here's verse, as for you, you were dead. That came to me this week because a friend of mine actually said this to me. He said, it's Easter. Christ is alive. Why do I feel so dead? And I thought that is going on in a lot of homes, every city in America, People just feel discouraged, depressed, despair. It's almost like I feel, I feel spiritually dead. I feel emotionally dead. I am financially dead. My social life is dead. And I just want to ask one question at the beginning of this brand new series we're doing. And the question is this. Paul starts by saying, as for you, you were dead, but nobody wants to get stuck in that condition. Nobody wants to go, I'm discouraged, I'm depressed, I'm despair. I just feel dead all over. And I got one question, and it's back to question, it's back to Foldsum's question. And here it is. How do you restore passion? How do you restore joy? How do you restore spiritual health? And I couldn't wait to unleash this message because I have given this message for 10 years all around the globe because I believe it starts this way. The passage starts with Ephesians 2.1, but it doesn't stay there. And Ephesians chapter 2 was written to help every single Christian on the planet rise from the dead emotionally and spiritually and live with passion instead of having their souls paved over. And then, now, where do you discover it? Glad you asked. All you have to do is go further in the chapter. It starts with, as for you, you were dead. And then here is God's prescription for coming back alive and staying alive. And the apostle Paul writes these outstanding words. He says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Three words contain three things. Number one, he says this. Number one, we are God's. He starts by saying the first word is God's, but he doesn't stop there. Then he goes on and says this. We are God's. The second word is workmanship. That's a great Greek word. It's the word poema from which we get the word Pizza Hut. No, I'm kidding. It's the word we get poetry from. And it's saying, when you belong to God, you become God's work of art. He starts working in your life. You are God's 
workmanship, but it doesn't stop there either. Okay, it keeps going. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? Here it is, good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That is the entire Christian life in one verse. We are God's, we are God's workmanship, and we're created to do good works. In other words, if you break it out in terms of how would you and I live this this week, here's what he's really saying. We are God's, number one is, how do I do this? I let God love me. In other words, we are God's. Verses eight and nine tell you how that happens, by grace through faith, and we belong to God, and all of a sudden, I've got a love relationship with God. And when I let God love me, I start coming back to life. We are God's, but it doesn't stop there. It says, I, it says we are God's, but it also says we are God's workmanship. And that means I do the hard work of letting God change me. Okay, so I let God love me, we are God's, and then I'm God's workmanship, I let God change me, and then here's the entire Christian life in one verse. He says, and I let God use me, I was created in Christ Jesus for good works. Folks, this is the entire Christian life in one verse. You wanna walk with God, you wanna restore joy, you wanna get hope back, you want passion rising in your life, it is all right here. It's also, in my opinion, the deepest theological teaching in the Bible on building a thriving relationship with God and a thriving life. Matter of fact, if you wanna put it in fancy theological terms, here we go. When I let God love me, that's salvation. When I let God change me, that's sanctification. And when I let God use me, that's service. Salvation, sanctification, and service all in one verse. Or if you're going, hey, bring the cookies down lower on the shelf, right? Here we go. He's saying this, let God love me. That is God working for us. Letting God, this is God working in us. And this is God. In other words, he's saying, man, God wants to work for you. And he already has. He wants to work in you. And he wants to work through you. That's the whole Christian life in one verse. And I just want to tell I'm very excited about what could happen to you and I and Willow and Chicago, and in your case, the world, if we took these three things and we basically spent the rest of our life building these three things into our life every day, every week. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to unpack each one. The first one is this. We are God's. You know what that means? That means I let God love me. I let God love me. What does that mean? It means I start viewing Jesus and Christianity not as religion, not as rituals, not as rules, but as a relationship with the living God. And what that means on a daily basis is this. Way too many people, I go to church on Sunday, feel the love of God, disconnect the rest of the week. What that means is I get up and I daily connect with this book and I let God work in me. Now, what happens to me if that happens. Maybe the best way to describe that is this. Uh, some of you have heard of the Chase Manhattan Bank. You've been to Manhattan, you've seen it. It's a magnificent 60-story skyscraper in downtown Manhattan. And what you may not know is this. When they were building the Chase Manhattan Bank, they got halfway through, and all of a sudden they discovered, to their horror, this was being built on quicksand. And it was eventually going to lean, and then it was going to lean farther, and that this 60-story skyscraper was going to topple over, kill a whole lot of people, and destroy part of Manhattan. And they just went, what do we do? Do we dismantle it? What do we do? Then they thought up something ingenious. Uh, they sank pipes deep into the quicksand, and through those pipes, they injected uh, they injected a solution of sodium silicate and calcium chloride, and they injected that in, in it. and just a few weeks, what happened is this, that sand turned into watertight sandstone, and that, bini- that building was finished and has been standing safely ever since. That is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 7, happens to your life and my life when we inject God's word. When I inject God's word into my life, it decreases anxiety. When I inject this into my life, it increases stability. I need that right now. When I inject this into my life, it draws me closer to God. It gives me strength to resist temptation. It helps me make smart, wise decisions which shape my future. If this book comforts me when I'm discouraged, it'll impact every relationship. Letting God love me, what, I, what that means is you throw yourself in the arms of God and you live 
in the presence of God. Too many of us are trying to get people into heaven when God wants to get some heaven down into us. And that happens when you basically say, I am going to let God love me. That's the whole Christian life. That's first base, and it starts there. Now, it doesn't stop there, though. It says, we are God's. Let God love me. Okay. Then it says this, we are God's workmanship, which is I let God change me. There are a lot of people who are going, hey, I'm happy to connect with Jesus, go to church, and that's about it. For I am not about to let him turn my life right side up. That happens on a daily basis if you're walking with God. I don't really like telling embarrassing stories about me, but here we go. Okay, I pastor a church up in uh, Northern California called Bayside. We have a whole bunch of campuses, and Sunday mornings are crazy. Okay, I mean, we have six services. You're speaking. A few years ago, when my kids were little, I had four young kids, and we were living in Folsom, and we had to, we had to drive over the Folsom Dam Road to go to Granite Bay, and, and we did six services, went to a Super Bowl party, that, and then it is late night. I am tired. I'm grouchy. I had spoken on the joy of the Lord, but I had none of it. And I am driving back over this Folsom Dam Road, and I don't see this thing coming. It's about 8.30 at night. We're driving in the old minivan we had, and I hit a 18-inch deep pothole going about 45 to 50 miles an hour. Front left tire explodes. Back left tire explodes. I keep control of this van. I pull into this overlook over Folsom Lake, Folsom Dam, and I completely lose my cool. I grab my, my kids are all little. I think my son, Mark, at that point, maybe is seven or eight years old. And I get on, I get on, I call AAA and I go, get out of here and pick me up. And then I hang up and I lose it for about a minute, okay? And and I, I'm going, what moron can't fix this road? If the government were so I, I so I lose it for about a minute. I'm going, I cannot believe it. And I'm blaming the president. I'm blaming our California governor. I'm blaming everybody I can. And that I blow up. That's about a minute. And I don't know if any of you have a quick fuse. It goes off. And then a minute later, you feel like a jerk. Okay. That's exactly what happened to me. I get out. This is embarrassing to tell you all. I get out of the van. I walk over to the lake. And now it's about nine o'clock at night. It's nice moons out. And, and so I apologized to God and asked God for forgiveness. And then my son, Mark, had gotten out of the car. Everybody else was in it. The other kids were asleep. Mark got out of the car and he just stood next to me. And I said, you know what, son? Um, let me just tell you this. Uh, this is not the kind of Christian. I just want to apologize, man. That's not the kind of example for you all want to be. That's not the kind of Christian I want to be. And I just, I looked down. And Mark had said, hey, will you forgive me? Okay, he nodded his head. And then he looked at me, eight years old. He looked at me and said, you know, Dad, things like this happen. (laughs) I said, thank you, son. Maybe you can disciple me later. I go get back in the van. Mark's still outside. And then I and then I said to Carol, hey, look, I acted like a child. Will you forgive me? (laughs) She, being my wife, agreed, then did. And then I said, I also apologize to Mark. And she looked at me and said, oh, do you apologize to Mark? I said, yeah. She said, oh, that's a good thing. And I said, why? And she said, because the minute you got out, Mark leaned forward and said, you know, dad doesn't handle stuff like this well, does he? And before you judge me, okay, let me ask you a question. What don't you handle well? And the best thing about a thriving daily relationship with Christ is this, I don't have to be tomorrow what I was like yesterday. And matter of fact, Willow, you don't have to be tomorrow what you were like yesterday. God loves to do new things in his people. And if I will let God love me, that gets on the inside. And then I let God change me and I become a brand new person every day. This is phenomenal news and it doesn't stop there. Here's the problem. A lot of Christians are like, hey, I'm cool. Let God love me, fine. Let God change me fine. In other words, Jesus loves me. This I know. My pastor told me so. And mine might change a little, but I'm stopping right there. The problem is this. The Bible does not stop there. It says the whole Christian life is I am loved by God. I am transformed by God, but I am also, here it is, I am used by God. I let God use my life. And the minute I say this, you are on this planet for one reason. We do a lot of team teaching at Bayside. And a while back, our pastor from Ireland, Andrew McCourt, was sitting next to me, and we are just, we are literally preaching on a weekend service together. We're going back and forth. And Andrew looked at this crowd and he said, I want to say to you, 
you are not here by accident. He said, I believe God from all of eternity knew that there was something in the world that was needed at this time, and from all of time and eternity, he created you and knew that a couple thousand million years later, you would be needed then, and that's why you were born then. And I stopped him, and I said, right in front of the whole church, I stopped and said, are you telling me that God doesn't create people and then figures out what to do with them? He had a purpose and a specific set of assignments, and he created them from all eons past and brought them and, and he said, he looked at, he looked the whole crowd and he said, that's not all I'm saying. He said, I am saying that not only is that true, but you are in your geography in this generation on purpose, which is why you're here. And to miss that is to miss everything. The problem is this. Some of you are looking at me going, yeah, but you don't understand it, man. I, I can't speak. I can't sing, and that's about all it looks like God uses, okay? I am an introvert. I can't stuff stuff. And it's, could God use little old me? I mean, I'm a plumber. I'm a business person. What, what, could God actually use somebody like me? There was a resounding yes on that one, and I can prove it. Years ago, I was a senior pastor in Southern California. And I resigned being a senior pastor, and I got a promotion, and I became a youth pastor. The problem is this, I moved from a multicultural area in Los Angeles and I moved up to Marin County, California. And Marin County, if you all have never been, uh, Marin County at that point was the wealthiest county in the United States. There were almost 300,000 people there. It was 97% Caucasian. It was so lily white, it was sickening. I mean, the, matter of fact, uh, Robin Williams, the comedian, came from Marin County. He said there's an ethnic detector on the Golden Gate Bridge. And any non-white yuppies that try to get in, it flips them into the San Francisco Bay. That was a Marin County. I arrived at Marin County, and I ended up becoming the youth pastor at the church right in the center of the county that had almost all the wealthy people going to that church and almost all of their teenagers. You want to take a wild guess what they were like? I walk into high school, Sunday school class for the first time and I almost quit. I realize I'm looking at 18 of the brightest, best looking logo on everything, Harvard, Princeton, Chicago, bound student I've ever seen in my life. And I also went, this is the most apathetic bunch of church brats I have ever seen. They are bored to death in church. They are as self-centered as you could be. There is no difference. They are not taking their faith seriously. And I literally went, I'm going to get them into missions and service if it kills me. It nearly did. I walked back into that same Sunday school class the next week. And I said, hey, what do you do during Easter? And I didn't let him answer because I said, because this Easter, we're going to Mexico. We're setting up in a tent city. We're going to work with poor people. We are going to, I gave him this hour long manipulative pitch about going to Mexico and serving God with the poorest of the poor and helping people and, and literally connecting with folks down there. And I said, at the end of this thing, and I'm pretty motivational with teenagers if I have to be. And at the end of that, I got them. And I said, all right, who's going with me? And they all went, no, 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 no. Folks, literally 18 straight no's. And I finally said, what do you do during Easter? One girl said, oh, last Easter I flew to Paris and shopped. But she said it like, didn't we all? Welcome to Marin County. Most of them though said this, man, you don't get it, right? We ski, we ski. That's what we do. We ski in Aspen, ski in Vail, we ski. It took six months of motivating, challenging, teaching, um, literally, literally, uh, outright lying, actually. You know, matter of fact, these guys after a couple months are coming up to me and they're going, Ray, man, you just got to know. We know we should go. It would be good to go to Mexico. We know we should do this thing. But you don't get it, man. We ski together. It's a tradition. And I'm saying stuff like, bring your skis. The skiing in Mexico in April is off the hook, okay? So April arrives, and I have 38 high school students bound, gagged, and handcuffed, and on their way to Mexico, some of those students still have not recovered from that trip. We get into Mexico, and we pull in, and the first thing they see are four teenagers, Mexico, Mexico teenagers, laying a friend of theirs down by the side of the road. No arms, no legs. Evidently, this kid had, had four amputations. And these rich kids are looking at me going, what happened? 
And I'm saying stuff like, I don't know, maybe he didn't have enough money to get medical help in time. And that got at him. And people with sick kids, with their ribs sticking out that couldn't afford $25 to go to a doctor, that got at them. And multiple families living in a cardboard shack, that stuff got at them. And car, I, I, the whole thing, it just started to get after two or three days. But the big shocker was this. We headquarter with a thousand other people and then our church goes and for the first time ever, I'm taking 38 teenagers to the middle of nowhere, Mexico, and we get into nowhere, Mexico, and we go down some dirt road to where our church is supposed to be. And what's supposed to happen is this. You're supposed to pull up and there's a worship service going on in the church. And you go in and you worship with these folks and then you team up, you have lunch together and you spend your whole week building relationships and bringing the love of Christ to their whole community in any way you can serve that community with these folks. The second we pull up to our church though, I realize there's something terribly wrong. Four charred walls, roof is burned and crashed in. And now I have 38 teenagers looking at me going, way to go, Ray. And I'm thinking the same thing until I hear noise in the building. And I said, wait here. And I sneak around to the back and I look through this burned out window and I looked up front and here's what I see. Up front, there's a young, tough looking Mexican national pastor and he's preaching his heart out to nine very discouraged looking people sitting on these charred benches. And I just stood there watching this, and I thought, what do I do? Do I go in? Do I stay out? What do I do? And I thought, you know, we just drove a thousand miles. I waved these kids over. I go, let's go to church. They all come over, and it had to be a major shock. This is the middle of nowhere, Mexico, and all of a sudden, 38 yuppie teenagers from Marin County come file in the back of this guy's church. He's so shocked, he stops his sermon, and he looks at these kids and says, que pasa? which translated means, what are you yuppies doing here? And we had this kid that spoke Spinglish, and he looks and he says, he says, we're Christians, we're from the U.S., we're here to help and serve in any way we can. And you could tell this pastor understood this and he got real intense and real emotional. And I literally, you could have cut the tension with a knife. He's staring at our kids. Our kids are staring back at him. These poor nine people on the benches, they don't know what to do. And he gets real intense for about 30 seconds. And this pastor just kind of shakes. And then he says, they, and we found out later there's a gang in the village. And he said, they burned our little church down six months ago. And then he looked right at these 30, 18 years and And for six months, we've been praying that help would come. But we'd given up any hope help would ever arrive. But here you are. And our kids were stunned silent for the first time ever. And this one kid who is not a humble kid, he actually blurts out and he goes, hey, they've been praying. We showed up. He looks around and he goes, hey, we're an answer to prayer. You know what's interesting? That was their theme. They walked all over the place. They were high-fiving each other going, answer to prayer. And you know what's interesting is? Back home, they caused prayer. Down there, they were an answer to prayer. With these beautiful, gorgeous Marin County high school girls, some who never even seen dirt. They came down with truckloads of curling irons because I forgot to tell them there's no electricity. Two days in, they've stashed that stuff. They've thrown a bandana on and they have never looked more attractive because there is a sparkle in the eyes of girls that are living for something more important than just looking good that is never there when the only thing they care about is their appearance. And matter of fact, same thing with the guys. We're these useless high school guys. Matter of fact, we're in the building the second day. This kid goes and he goes, hey, why don't they have a rough? Gee, I guess it burned down. He goes, why don't they put a new one or not? Don't it ever rain down here? I'm going, it's a convertible church. I, think, I said, they spent every single thing they had on the first one. Some of these people have no money left. He shocks everybody by going, why don't we pay for it? He whips off the sombrero and every, these Marin County kids are getting out wads like you've never seen. And two days later, 
all 38 high school guys and girls, all of them, all the villages are on the roof nailing a brand new roof, and that was finished in two days. New windows, new roof for the entire church, which didn't do any good anyway, because by the end of the week, so many people are coming to the evangelistic services at night that our teenagers are putting on and leading worship at and speaking at and all this kind of stuff. So many people are flocking to this church. We had to move the entire thing outside because they couldn't fit on the inside. Well, these kids get home and they go back to school. And the friends are like, man, nice tan. Where'd you go? Vail? Aspen Tahoe? They're going, no, where'd you go? Mexico. What? You can't ski in Mexico. What'd you do? An hour later, their friends are running to try to get to class and our kids are chasing them down going, I built a church. I'm an answer to prayer. What happened to our youth group is this. These kids finally caught a vision that if they would let God love them and they would let God change them and they would go the extra step and let God use them, passion flooded back into their lives, back into the youth group. And the next year, we had 86 students sign up to sign up to go to Mexico. The problem is this, our church had no bus, no van. So I stood in front of our church in Marin County, wealthy Marin County. And I said to the adults, hey, we are taking 86 students to Mexico. We need to borrow your cars. That was the exact response. Dead silence, nothing. We had a guy that has the gift of guilt. The next week, he got up and wrecked our church with one statement. Al Wade got up and he looked at our church and he said, did you hear the rumor about our church? The adults in our church are willing to send their kids, but not their cars to Mexico. It was awesome. We had 18 vehicles donated that Sunday to go down to Mexico. One guy, Tim Stanish, donated a four-door Mercedes-Benz, which I drove to protect. I felt responsible for it. People, as long as I live, I will never forget being in a burned out shell of a building in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, when watching 38 teenagers catch fire for the very first time because they had discovered when these three things become your lifestyle, when these three things become what you're about, when these three things become your highest priority, when you start taking God seriously and you start taking the transformation power of God, and when you start believing that God that created you puts you here on personal level, you wake up and discover you have become the answer to somebody's prayer. That will light you on fire. And I want to close with this question. Why would you want to live any other way? The million dollar question on all this is this. How do you start? It all starts right here. I let God love me. And if you're watching this right now, I'm going to give you a chance to apply the two verses right before. By grace, you are saved through faith. If you're going, man, I would love to be forgiven. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I would love a new start. I would love Christ in my life. I would love Christ to come in my life and set me free and transform me and use me. I want passion back. I want strength back. That can happen right now. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. And Jesus, I believe you died on a cross and rose again. And so right now, I ask you to forgive me for all my sin. I let the past go. Jesus Christ, come into my life. I receive you right now. Be my Savior. And be my Lord. Call the shots. Wrap your arms of love around me. Transform me from the inside. And I give you my life. So use my life. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Ray. So if you prayed with us, man, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's a huge step in your journey of faith. And we would love to connect with you. We'd love to help you with, with a few next steps. So if you're watching on willowcreek.tv and our church online platform, you could just hit the button in the chat feature and we'll give you more information there. But if you're following along somewhere else, just text the word next steps to the number 224-512-4463. We would love to join you and walk with you as you continue in this journey with Jesus. 
Now for everyone, I'm just so glad that you joined us. If maybe this is your first time joining us or maybe you've been joining us for a while, but you would love to just get connected deeper, uh, you can text the word NEW to the number 224-512-4463. Now we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up. Next week, I'm going to continue the series called Standing Strong in a Shaken World. But we've got other things going on in the life of our church. We've got virtual small groups. We've got daily devotionals. We have podcasts, programs for students and for kids. Uh, In fact, we're trying something new in the next few weeks. We've got these Zoom coffee conversations with, with our pastors where we're talking about all kinds of topics like balancing work and parenting or navigating shelter in place family dynamics or leading through crisis or even processing grief in this unique season. You can connect to all of this at willowcreek.org slash next steps. And now it's time for us to collect our offering. Yeah. So as you heard before, last week, over 300 people made decisions to follow Jesus at our Easter services. And that's amazing, guys. God is moving at Willow. Our care center, still helping families every week, still reaching out, loving our community with the hands and feet, loving our community with the love of Jesus. And all this is possible because you continue to be faithful in giving. And I just want to say thank you. So if you'd like to give and you're watching online, you can click the Give button at the top of your screen to learn more. Or you can just text the letters WCSB, as in Willow Creek, South Barrington, to the number 77977. Now with that said... If you're in a season where you need some help, maybe with some tangible things like food, emotional support, if there's any way that we could pray for you or help you, I encourage you to to visit willowcreek.org or the Willow Creek app to learn more. We'd love to help. Now with that, let's go and let's be the church this week. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. Amen. Blessings, everyone. testimony from God.
There's no running from you. Your love is present everywhere I go. And I will hold to the truth that you're the God who won't ever let go. Let our hope come alive. 